Welcome to the Why Did I Get Cancer podcast. I'm Deborah Herlax Enos, a small town girl turned TV nutritionist and healthy living expert. I design health programs for the average guy or gal, including those average guys named Metallica. On September 1st, 2020, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I asked every oncologist the same question, why did I get cancer? But none of my doctors had good answers for me. I wanted answers and that's why I started this podcast. I wanna help you to lower your cancer risk and provide self-care tips for those in the battle. I'm getting answers and I wanna share them with you. Today's podcast guest is uh, Chris Carr. I gotta tell you, I have been enjoying her information about wellness for the last probably 12 years. And she is a 21 year cancer survivor of stage four incurable cancer. I had so many questions for her. How do you maintain, you know, your focus and, and peace and Zen on a daily basis when you know you have tumors inside of your body? And, you know, her, her answer was, was really interesting. And she said, I have just learned to love all parts of my body. And that's no easy task. And she said, I am a ruthlessly difficult person, but she said, I have a strategy and a system where I just keep going back to love and she stays in love and not always because she said, sometimes I have to really let it rip, but I also love her too. You got to listen to the rest of the podcast. I, um, I was, I just so enjoyed my conversation with Chris. Um, she, you've probably seen her on the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, she has um, high accolades from Cheryl Crow and Deepak Chopra on her website. And I have to tell you, our conversation was so down to earth. I think maybe my expectation was, oh my gosh, you know, how's this conversation going to go? And you know what? It went beautifully. We laughed. We might have cursed a little bit, but you got to listen to the rest of the podcast. I know you'll be blessed by it. Oh, welcome, Chris Carr. I have been, um, I'll just say maybe stalking you on your website for the last probably 10 or 12 years. Love your content. And I was introduced to you somehow online, probably watching you on Oprah or something way before I got diagnosed with cancer. So it's such a treat to have a conversation as a post-cancer survivor thriver. So welcome to Why Did I Get Cancer? Um, thanks for having yeah. me, Deb. Yeah, it's really, it's going to be a an amazing conversation. And you just celebrated an anniversary. I did. So I've been living with stage four cancer for 21 years now, and I just had my 21 year scan and everything is still stable. Everything's still hanging out. Everything's yeah. still there, but it's, it's just, um, all my tumors are behaving. So I feel very <laughs> grateful for that right now. Tumor behavior. That is such a interesting, interesting way to start, uh -huh. but Humor etiquette. Everybody behave. Right. I'm chill. I'm relaxed. <laughs> I'm eating all the right things. And um, and you're also really doing the work. And one of the reasons I started this podcast is I just wanted to know why, why, and quite honestly, how in the heck did I get diagnosed with breast cancer when I've been in health and wellness for over 30 years? I've eaten organic, non-GMO, haven't used deodorant with aluminums and aluminum in forever. And so I started this podcast because I needed this podcast. So yeah. how do you, after 21 years, it's only been almost four years for me, 21 years, how do you make peace with your body? Hmm. That's such a beautiful question and so important. You know, I started my journey of sharing my story and my teachings not long after I was diagnosed. So Crazy Sexy Cancer, my film, aired on the Discovery Channel in 2007. My books started to come out around then. And, you know, I've just written my seventh book. So I did very much the same thing that you are doing, which is I had a big question that I wanted answered. And so I started to create around that question. And 
For me, living with cancer is more of a mental game than a physical game right now at this point in my journey, because I have a very strange stage four sarcoma that can behave, well, it does behave differently than most, if not all cancers. Um, So right now for me, it's just been hanging out. So it can be slow growing, it can be aggressive, it can start slow growing and become aggressive. And so it's really a watch and wait, let cancer make the first move type right. of approach that I've been taking. And during that time, it's it's for me, it's become about watching and living and learning how to take care of myself. And I would say the big question that I reframe around any rupture, any big shit pickle that happens in our lives, and there will be many of them, for many of us, it includes cancer, is not to get too caught up in the why, because sometimes we can never answer that question. To your point, you did everything, quote unquote, right, mm-hmm. right? And so it can be so frustrating. And and for a lot of people, I think we can get stuck in that why. I certainly was stuck in the why for quite some time. And then sh- so instead of being in that why, because again, we don't know. We have no idea why cancer, right? We just know a lot of people get diagnosed. And so I think a better question to ask is what? So what can I do now that I have this information? What can I do to support my body? What can I do to support my mental well-being? What can I do to support my spirit, my joy? What can I do now? And that's really the approach that I've taken. Making peace with my body is about loving and caring for all parts of me, even the parts of me that are struggling. So, you know, 24 tumors in my body, those are not things that I have hatred towards. Those are not, um, you know, I can't get rid of them. I can't like cut them out and go on with my life. You know, they have become, they are a part of me, whether I like it or not. There's other things that I don't like about my body or myself or my personality. And whether you know, if I put if I put those things in a basket, a negative basket, I'm going to start to like me less and less and less. And I think this journey of being alive and being lucky enough to be alive is learning how to enjoy your own company. I enjoy my own company partly because I've chosen not to hate myself and and hate parts of myself or be frustrated or um, amputate the parts of myself that are struggling. Because last thing I'll say is we can't amputate any of ourselves or any of our emotions and expect to be whole. Oh, that was really rich. (laughs) I feel like I need to push the pause button and just think about and meditate on these things. But you... um, I think one thing that really stood out is that you you love your body and you lo- even these tumors these 24 tumors that are there you embrace and that isn't that isn't easy when you feel like at least in my case I felt like my body betrayed me and I struggled mm-hmm. with that for quite a few months of yeah oh yeah Well, Mm -hmm. I did too, though. Very much so. Very much so. You know, I was pretty much a professional athlete before I started this wellness journey. And so you you put a lot of time and energy into your body. And how how could you repay me with this? These are very common experiences. Every one of these thoughts are so common and so normal and so natural because it's like, you know, we don't have a roadmap for this. And it's really a roadmap for trauma. That's true. Being diagnosed is incredibly traumatic. And so it's why I wrote this book about grief and loss and all the big, messy emotions that happen when life falls apart. It's because we need a field guide. (laughs) We need to understand that, you know, these thoughts that you might even later down the road, like I remember feeling ashamed that I'd even have those thoughts. All of it is going to, it's just the playing field. We're playing a new game now. And I had to work on that because the more I go to the place of how could you have done this to me, 
the more I'm going to continue to abandon myself, which is the opposite of what I need to survive and thrive with cancer. Well said. And again, embracing every cell is sounds like what you do. And it's what I do too. And sometimes I look in the mirror and I, I even use, I would say violent language saying, oh, you had your breast amputated. And mm -hmm. I'm making peace with that. I wish it hadn't happened. I wish I had my old body back. Um, but I'm trying to, uh, you know, really kind of just send <laughs> loving thoughts and acceptance to pieces that are now not part of my original operating system. And that has been a, that has been a struggle for me. Well, I think it's so profound what you're saying. And it, of course it's going to be a struggle. It's very different. It's not the norm. Right. And so of course it's going to be a struggle. And, but I would say that it's, you know, it's a practice and every practice is a struggle. Mm. Um, this is the practice of being a, mental health Olympian, right? This is the practice of saying, I am going to choose love. I'm not always going to get it right. There's going to be days where I'm like, I fucking hate this. Yep. Right. But more often than not, I'm moving on that path of love. I don't even know for me, sometimes it feels like making peace and other times it's, it's just, hey, hey, I'm just going to keep coming mm. back to love. I know I'm going to detour because I'm a human being. I'm just going to keep coming back. My practice is just to come back. But I'm, I'm ruthlessly difficult. So it, it's not like I'm the Dalai Lama sitting in front of you. But I have a practice right. to deal with my difficult. That is good. So you recognize your, 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 yeah. uh, your difficult edges. <laughs> oh. A hundred percent without question. And we have to, to really have, mm -hmm. you know, mastery over this and we'll never really have mastery. So I'm trying to think of the word under mastery and that's the word I want to use. But um, to just recognize that, you know, people always said to me, you've got such a good attitude. You know, sometimes I'm just a real bitch and that's okay. <laughs> and I embrace her too, because she's, she's in there with all of the great mindsets. And that's what makes us who we are. I, I love that because I actually don't think you can have a good attitude if you don't also allow yourself to be, you know, whatever the other personality is that comes up du jour. It's more when we push all that yeah. down and, you know, like gloss over what's happening. That's unhealthy. That's what contributes to our energy loss, loss of self, disease loss of joy, you know, all of that. But when you can let it rip and be like, and that's okay too, it's so much easier to come back to your joy. It is so much easier. Joy just becomes, for me, it just becomes a, a bubbling brook, you know, where it's just like, it's just, it's bubbling up to the surface. And then my joy becomes contagious. And that's really my goal every day mm -hmm. is how do I make my joy contagious and just walk in love and generosity. That's beautiful. That's fantastic. Yes, I've learned please. a lot. A <laughs> I've learned a lot these last four years. So um, when I think about how I've you know, been on your website for the last 10, 15 years, and now we're having this conversation, how is Chris in 2024 different from Chris right before cancer, your cancer diagnosis. Oh, <laughs> I, do. That far back. I think, um, I think there's a lot of really cool <laughs> lessons there that I can't wait to hear about. <laughs> well, I wasn't, I was, I just came out of a really difficult breakup. I was in a very different career. I wasn't taking care of myself the way I'm certainly taking care of myself now. My diet and lifestyle was all based around what I needed to eat for my career and um, how I needed to look for my career. And so, you know, cut to stage four cancer, no cure, no treatment, watch and wait, watch and live, 
figure out what the heck that mm-hmm. means. You know, I spent probably about the first 10 years of my journey, which also happened to be connected to this new career that I'm in now, really focused on what I should be eating because it felt like that's something I can control. And I was so new, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to the standard American diet and all the information that is so readily available to us now that really you had to yeah. read books. Like You, you had, had to, to totally dig, dig. over yeah. decades ago. And I think it's one of the reasons why I created my first book is because I wanted to speak to other people like me um, and take that information that I had been just devouring and, and share it. And so I spent, you know, a good chunk of time doing that. And, um, and then I would say in the last 10 years, it's really been the focus has been slowly shifting uh, my focus, not the, everything that we do as a company, but my focus has been shifting more towards addressing what's eating me and what's eating you. And together, that's the holistic path. You can't, we can't really feel better when we eat like crap and don't take care of ourselves. And we certainly, even when we eat really well and we take care of ourselves, we can't feel better if we're su- suffering um, mentally. And so so that's where my focus has been. And, and I wish I could go back and <laughs> have a heart to heart with her right after she was diagnosed, the, the younger 31-year-old me and say, it's going to be okay. And you're going to learn a lot. Just hang in there. Um, I don't even think she really needed that pep talk. <laughs> like the me now would probably need that pep talk, but she, she definitely didn't need that. She was just like, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> but did you have it? I had certain yeah. parts of it. Yeah, I had certain yeah. parts of it, but I, I don't think I understood the yeah. mental an emotional weight that it would take. And then, and I also wasn't ready at the time to really experience that part. It was it's just very easy to get busy doing for me. Um, so like, give me a plan, give me something to do, something to learn, something to, you know, get good at. And I can bury my focus in that. And that's honestly what I needed at the time because it was my lifeline. Wow. So... Could you say that cancer has certainly changed your career? Oh, without question. I was in a very different career. Right. Prior. So, so <laughs> has cancer made your life better in a way? In some areas. Yeah. Some areas it's been, it's opened the doors for me. I mean, I opened the doors for me really, but I wouldn't have opened the doors if I didn't have this inspiring (laughs) (laughs) Uh, shit pickle. Um, uh, Yeah, but but it did inspire me to share and to really share from a vulnerable and authentic, connected place to try to help others. I think that's been the best thing that's happened. And being able to meet so many really incredible people throughout my career and people who are patients and people who are healers and helpers. And yeah, it's really made my life rich. I also met my husband through this experience. So, you know, it it kind of was a little matchmaker there, which I wouldn't have expected. But, um, you know, it's not a gift. I I can't really stand that terminology, although there are blessings and gifts in it. Um, And we, for me, I choose to look for them, you know, I search for them because it keeps me in a much p- more positive place. Yeah, I, I also no. wouldn't. I wouldn't say cancer was a gift. It was the gift I never knew I wanted. But <laughs> you know, we have an opportunity to be different after a diagnosis, a death. We'll talk about you know your new book here. But we have an opportunity at that point to open the box and embrace it or to put it back on a shelf and duct tape it closed. And Mm -hmm. I just Mm -hmm. wanted to open the box. And I would say that cancer has made me very different. And um, I think before cancer, I really cared 
about what people thought of me. And I, I cared about the show. I'll say that with air quotes. And now I just, I want no show. <laughs> the show doesn't matter how you look, how you, you know, all of those things. I just don't care anymore. And that has really given me a great opportunity to rest. Hmm. I love that. Sure. That's so powerful. A hundred percent. I think when we get closer to who we want to be, we start to slough off all of the, not all of it. I mean, it's a process, but we start to prune what isn't working because I think, you know, you have to learn how to say yes mm-hmm. to you. And cancer has taught me how to say yes to me. It's none of us want to disappoint people and, you know, it's, it's a lot of pressure to go along, to get along and to, to just be in the world. And, um, but when you have such a big mind shifting experience that connects you to more, your mortality, I think it does inspire us to come back and say yes to us more often than not. Yeah. And saying yes to us is really not a cultural norm here, is it? No, I don't think it is. I I think it's changing though. You know, I I definitely think it's changing, um, especially for women, but it's, you still have to go against the grain of, of society and to your point, cultural norms, and that makes it more uncomfortable. So therefore it's going to make you feel more uncomfortable. And so we each get that opportunity to stand in that discomfort and choose ourselves regardless. Standing in the discomfort and Um, It's a practice to stand in the discomfort and not feel like in this discomfort, you know, how can I, how can I do something for you? And how can I do something for you? No, no, just do something for yourself by standing in the discomfort. That's it. That's the practice. Um, We're not here to fix it Uh. for everybody else. Preach it, sister. Yeah, we're not here to fix it. Yeah, <laughs> boy. It's, um, I, I, I've been a lifelong fixer. I don't know if you have too, but um, cancer really cured me of that. So one of my one of my things I'm most grateful for. Oh gosh, you can say thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. You know, thank you so much. There's a lot of things I am not grateful for, but that one yeah, I will give boy, you. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um. So you have a new book out. I'm not a morning person, M-O-U-R-N. And um, the title is is um, really piqued my interest. And then I was reading about you had such a precious relationship with your dad. And that really, you know, helped you create this book. Can you tell us about um, maybe a couple of things that you just loved about your dad? Oh, well, my dad was very magical and I share his stories and wisdom and advice throughout the book. Um, I'll just take a step back and talk about why I wrote this book, because at the time, my publishers were really encouraging me to write something different because it had been a while Mm -hmm. since I'd written a book and it was like inspirational, peppy, you've got this type of thing. I was like, no, (laughs) (laughs) moving on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we got to go deeper, yeah. right? We have to go much deeper because I think the lives that we want to live oftentimes start in this work. Um, and so, uh, you know, at the time we were going through the global pandemic, I was coming up against my 20 year cancer anniversary. My business was struggling because I hadn't life proof my business as I was choosing to step back to be more present for my family. And, you know, it's just a lot yeah. coming up and when all of that's happening, of course, old trauma, old shit that you think that you're over is also coming to the surface for healing too. And so I, I've been sharing with you know, a lot of the podcasts that I've been doing that up until that point, even though I'm 20 years into being a wellness figure, I've done a lot of my own research, have an incredible team of people who I work with who help me create really you know, science-backed research-based content that there was still a hole in my education. And that hole was all around mourning, loss, Mm -hmm. grief, trauma, you know, the big stuff, the messy emotions that happen, as I said, when you get kicked in the teeth. And um, so I needed the book that I wrote 
and I needed to go on the journey because I was on the on the edge of losing one of the most important people that will ever be in my life. And that is my chosen father who adopted me. And, um, and it was, it was a really rough experience. Um, and it applies to so many different things. Cause I think what we don't understand is that we're all going to go through loss throughout the day. You know, the mo- the moment we started this interview is no longer. And yesterday is no longer. And more of us have more days behind us than in front of us. And the kids are leaving an empty nest or the job loss or the miscarriage or, you know, your friend ghosting you. The loss of former sense of self as a cancer patient, right? So this is such a hot topic that's so prevalent for each of us. And yet as a society, we, we are domesticated in a very grief phobic, messy emotions averse society. So few of us walking around have the tools we need to survive the storms of this magnitude that each enough, every one of us will inevitably right. face. Um, and so, so with that all, with that all in mind, that's why this book now and why a lot of the beautiful, precious messages that you know, I use storytelling throughout the book because I like to teach through story of my dad come um, alive on the page because he was a character. He was really funny. He had a huge heart. And as his life was winding down, his fatherly advice was ratcheting oh, course, up, you know? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I'd say just to finally answer your question. Um, I'll share the biggest thing that I think was so precious to me and it's become like my guiding principle and compass for this time of my life and hopefully the rest of my life. But it was this idea that he told me to make your golden years Mm. now. And, you know, so many of us wait, we wait until all the ducks are in a row before we actually do the things that we want to do. And the thing is, is that ducks don't like to be in a row. They like to fly. And so do we. And so as his time was coming to an end, it was so clear that he had to grieve all the things that he wouldn't be able to do. And, um, and the wasted time that he felt that he had, you know, put into other things that he wished that he could have back, but he couldn't have back. And yet it was really poignant to see him make so much of his golden moments happen. So even though his life was much sh- shorter than we wanted it to be, um, he was living it in a very golden way. Wow. What an inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. He's true. True inspiration. inspiration. guys, you know by now that I'm a huge fan of salmon. I try to eat it at least two to three times per week. It's just fantastic for an anti-inflammatory diet, and I love the omega-3s that I get out of it. But here's the deal. I just found out that most salmon that you buy in the freezer section of the supermarket has been double frozen, meaning it's fished, it's frozen, it's defrosted, it's processed, frozen again, and then it lands on my plate. And you know what? I'm not okay with that. And when you freeze protein and then defrost it and freeze it again, you get um, texture changes, you get flavor changes, and the nutritional content is also going to change. So after I heard that, I reached out to my friends at ButcherBox and I said, hey, what gives here? And tell me about your salmon. And I was assured by ButcherBox that their salmon is frozen one time. And I am a big fan of that. And that's probably why their salmon tastes so good. So they have a great deal for my community right now. And you can get free salmon in every box for a year. That's two pounds of salmon, $20 off of your first box. And you just go to butcherbox.com forward slash Enos, and then use the code Enos to get this deal. Yes, I know that's a lot of the word Enos. Anyway, moving on. (laughs) Um, I don't know how long this deal is going to last. I'm a big fan of salmon, as I mentioned, but I'm a a big fan of really delicious salmon. And I love that it comes from Bristol Bay, um, Alaska. It's sustainably harvested, and they actually even have a way to track it so you can track it 
coming up from Bristol Bay, Bay all the way to your plate. So hope you enjoy this deal. To think about living your golden years now, because we wait, you're right, we wait. And I don't remember what the statistics are on how long people live post-retirement, but for certain mm-hmm. segments of the population, they're not great. So how do you embrace golden daily? That's the mm-hmm. question that each and every one of us get to answer. It's like the invitation that we're going to invite you listeners to explore mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's unique to each and every one of us. But what I will say is it doesn't have to be, I'm going to go skydiving. I'm going to book that trip to Paris right. right now. Like, yes, it can be those things if that's fun to you. I mean, Paris would be fun skydiving. Yeah, no Never thanks. in a million years. That's a hard pass for me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so... It can be these big adventurous experiences. And I think those are fun because they're they're big memories you can look back on at the end of the year. I like to do a year in review and then I like to kind of like set intentions for the year ahead. And it's fun to have those big mile markers, but golden moments are really the day to day. They can be the boring stuff, the in-between stuff, the the sinew of life Um, and that's where the rubber meets the road. That's the stuff that really adds up over time and makes you, you and your life a very rich experience. Um, and so that's, that's where I tend to put my focus because I can make sure that that happens today, mm-hmm. you know? And you can make sure that that happens today. And you're right. It's, it's going to be different for each person. And I, I think about um, the old me before cancer, I was what my husband calls head down, horns up, you know, type A, just getting it done and, you know, kind of aggressive language. And now, which, you know, yes, former athlete as well, collegiate athlete. I mean, I, I get it. Like, you know, you're just, you're just going, but where I embrace golden, and I'm just thinking about this now is pausing to connect with people. And I think the old me would be so busy where I'd think, uh, I'll just connect later. I, I don't have time to connect now. I have, I've mm-hmm. got to get this done. But connecting with people, be it you know when you're getting a coffee or you just run into a neighbor at the mailbox, wow, those are really turning out to be some of my most beautiful moments of the day. I love that. That's you and I are very much in alignment there. I think that's so important. And we know that statistically it's important too, because right now we are living in an epidemic of loneliness. Yeah. Right. And so we feel more isolated and, and more disconnected. And so I think that you sharing that is so important and it doesn't have to be the big, huge, let's have a three hour meal but it's that pause with your neighbor that fills you up in ways that you can't even imagine that actually helps your immune system. It helps your longevity. It helps your overall yeah. well-being. Yeah. And, and it, like you said, it doesn't have to be a three-hour meal. I mean, that's lovely, but it can just be a moment of, you know, again, just connecting with another person or sometimes when my day is just going to crap. I'll just think, I I just need to be generous right now to get out of this. And so maybe I do a review of somebody's podcast or I make a donation someplace. And Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, it's like Mm -hmm. that gets me out of me and back into a community that I'm not even talking to anybody right now. But I, yes, I'm doing something online, but it just kind of resets my compass a little bit. I love that. I think that's magical. Yeah. And- and that's how I am choosing to be different four years later. Mm-hmm. And way to pay it forward, because I think that that's the comes back to your whole idea of of wanting to spread good mm-hmm. energy. Because I think when people see that, when we see that, we get the opportunity to be struck by it and then to model it in our own lives. You know, it's it's we all need mentors Me too, and. We have mentors all around us. So everything that you're saying right now, I take in is like, oh, one of my mentors, Deb, is reminding me of just how important this is. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. It's uh, 
as we both know, it's been quite a journey. And I want to talk a little bit more about your book. And um, one of the the big pushes that you went through is when you were in a CVS parking lot and really hit with mourning your father. And how did that, how did you, how did you choose to let that move you into action to do the work, to write the book? Well, so I'll tell you the CVS Mm -hmm. parking lot story. I, um, it's actually right down the road from where I am right now. (laughs) Um, my mother had asked me to go out and get some more insurer, which is the only thing that my dad could consume at that time. And he, we didn't know how long he had, but it was not long. And I remember going to the aisle. I knew exactly what his flavor was that he liked. And I just stopped because I didn't know how many to buy because I didn't know how long he would be here. And that thought just sent me into a panic. And prior to that moment, I had done really everything I possibly could to just push down my feelings and not to allow them because I thought that they would they would kill me. I thought that I would drown. I thought that I'd never come back. And so um, it is that feeling of that tsunami you have to survive through. And I think that really that's the fight or flight yeah. response in our bodies. I just didn't know it at the time. And But this was the wave got ahead of me. I couldn't do any of my normal trickster sh- stuff to, you know, outrun it. And I ran through the drugstore and ran to my car and got in the car and just lost it. You know, it's like wanted to be in some sort of safish place and let myself just go cry, 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 sob, you name it. And it was after I let it all out that I felt a little better. It was like that um, moment when the medicine kicks in and you're like, headache is bursting or like dissipating. And then I thought to myself, if I'll feel a little bit better allowing myself to feel my feelings, why am I avoiding this? Why am I doing everything in my power to make it harder on myself by pushing it down, by overworking, by, you know, drinking too much, like getting, going back to things that are not healthy for me just because I needed to numb out because it was just too big in my mind. So it was the fear of the pain that was driving me, not the pain itself. Okay. Can we just, that, let's let that sink in. So it was the fear that was the driving force, not the actual pain. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we think about the fight or flight response, you know, it's, it's, it's chemical reaction in the body and we are designed to survive, to do anything in our power to survive right? From an evolutionary Mm -hmm. perspective. And so I didn't realize that I could recognize that that's what was happening. And with some awareness, I could apply some tools to help soothe my nervous system to kind of like get me to a place where I could be back in alignment with my right mind and, you know, um, and keep moving forward as opposed to numbing. Um, and so that really was the inciting moment for me where I realized that I could choose a different path. Um, and it, I knew it was going to get harder because, you know, I was in anticipatory yes. grief at the time and I didn't even know that was a yes. thing. I thought that grief only happened after loss. Meanwhile, grief started the day I heard he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, you know, so it, it, I, I had been experiencing it for several years. I just didn't know right. what it was. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That anticipatory grief and even anticipatory fear is, is, can be really, can be crippling and it gets so big in our head, but I love that you just had this cathartic (laughs) release in the CVS parking lot. And now you get to drive by it every couple of days as a reminder. Wow. I remember being there and, um, yeah, it 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 has really changed you. Absolutely. It's mm-hmm. softened me. Um, it's made me feel so much more willing to explore this stuff, these conversations, to, you know, it, I have a big chapter. So every chapter in the book is designed to address one of the other experiences or emotions that you may go through when you're going through a really difficult time. 
I talk about the rupture and that's that moment where life changes and some tips and strategies to uh, how to navigate that. But then we go into fear and anxiety. And, and for me, I have a chapter and it's all dedicated to anger because I didn't realize just how angry I would get because I thought anger and grief have right. to go together. Right. But for me, it was just bringing up a lot of past mm-hmm. trauma. And I think when we think about the fight or flight response, anger is a protector. Right? So when we're in that fight or flight response, it's so natural to find yourself in a rage. And in many plate ways, it's healthy to find yourself in a rage. It's just not healthy to right. stay there. Right. And so we can go in and learn about the wisdom of anger and, and actually very specific tools to help diffuse it. So you can get the information that you need to get and, you know, without like lighting your in, innards on mm-hmm. fire. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 I learned a lot through this process, quite honestly, and, and also about how to talk about dying and talk about death with the person that is about to go through it and what I want my own death to look like. Um, and, and living post death when you're here, but your person isn't, um, so it's, it's a, it's probably the most important book I'll ever write. Right. It's the hardest yeah. book I've ever And it, and it clearly yeah. shows, I mean, it's, it is, it's a, it's a hard, but encouraging book because it's encouraging us to have conversations that are necessary conversations. And the conversations you're talking about are, are really freedom conversations. Mm. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for saying that. I, I feel like that is the that is the end point. And that's really what we're all looking for. Yeah. We want to feel free. We want to feel joyful. We want to feel content. We want to feel good in our own companionship, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and unfortunately, the it's like that cliche saying is so dang true. No matter how many ways I've gone about trying to disprove it, I can't. The way out, the way to freedom is through. Yeah. I mean, it absolutely is. I mean, it's, you know, talking about walking through the shadow of, you know, of death. I mean, you're walking through, you're not pausing and having a picnic there. You know, you are walking through the valley and we got to keep in movement without staying addicted to busyness. And yeah, a hundred percent. Because that's, I think, in our society these days, you know, that's just such a contagious excuse. Oh, I'm just so busy. I, I can't do that right. I'm just, I'm just so busy. And okay, well, what would you be doing if you weren't so busy? Would you be connecting? Would you be doing some of this harder, harder work? Because right. for me, busy has been a cover up for a long time. Yeah. Oh, me too. Very much so. I have to say that a certain level of busy is yeah. is healthy. Um, but you and I are talking about a very different right. level, and that's when you're using it to avoid it's your life. Exactly right. Um, but the the busyness that is connected to passion and purpose, and you know, a focus that gives you joy. Yeah. Yes. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. Yes. So <laughs> I want to end with a final question. Um, I was just at the airport. Final question with the story. Um, Friday night, plane delayed three hours, and there were some really very angry people there and yelling and lots of F-bombs. And I thought, (laughs) oh my gosh, you guys, it's 10 o'clock at night. It's spring break. There's lots of little kids here going to Disneyland. Can we just... So how do you, on a daily basis, protect your peace? See that kind of energy is like gasoline oh. to me because I got I got a fuse and so that's that I get into that energy and I'm like oh yeah me I'm too. coming in <laughs> you know yeah and so um, for me it's about coming back to center and saying what would love say what would love do how do I move forward and you know take care of my space take care of my energy put good energy out in the world not get triggered by all the chaos that's around me. If I do get triggered and I go off to 
forgive myself, to, to apologize, do whatever yeah. I need to do, and then just come back home because that's that's really dicey terrain to walk. Anger is a signaling emotion, right? It signals there's something wrong, something's happening. It can signal injustice, all of the things, right? But it's oftentimes there's something so much bigger going on under the surface. It's not about the fact that the plane was, was delayed. It's not about the fact that the airlines are a mess. And we all have to get to the airport much right. earlier now. Just let's all get yeah. used to it. If you think... I always, I, I still, I realized in my last flight, oh, it's no longer true that you get there okay. an hour before a oh, domestic no. flight. No, it's two. You get yeah. there nine minutes. And if you don't, it's, it's totally you. true. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> uh, right. But oftentimes what's happening is somebody is triggered and there, it, this trigger is going back to a deep, fissure, a deep sense of pain, a deep sense of injustice, a deep, a deep trauma in their own lives. Yeah. Right. And so we can't take it personally. It doesn't mean that they don't have some work to do and that they don't have some cleanup and responsibility. We're not necessarily letting right. them off the hook. We don't have to get sucked in because we can say, oh, that's your trauma response. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just going to move away from right. this mess. Oh, I can have compassion for you. I can still judge you, but I can have compassion do, for yes. you. Right. And I do because this yeah. is it. Yeah. And I don't need to take this right. in. But I do find that behavior like that can be con contagious, just like joy can be contagious. Whew. Yeah. Well, you're 100% spot on. In fact, there's 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 evidence, there's proof. You know, there's a lot of research on that because it triggers – you know, uh, a cascade of our own biochemical mm -hmm. reactions. You know, it, it, your amygdala is like, <laughs> yeah, <"Fire!"> boom. <laughs> right. right, right. So 100%, we are networked emotionally, whether we realize it or not. And it's our opportunity to just understand that, be aware of it, and, and realize when we have to break from the matrix. But it's an intentional breaking from the matrix because we're also wired to be negative mm. as part of our survival so mechanism. True. This is like old evolutionary stuff. So you are actually being called to evolve at a much higher frequency and a much faster pace when that stuff happens because you're being asked if you choose consciousness, if you choose to move forward with a growth mindset, you're being asked to rewire your brain in real time and to create a new thought groove that you could then reinforce habitually over time. So it's a big invitation when we look at it from that perspective. Oh, I like that. And you know, when I think about it as an invitation to grow or an invitation to be different, then it softens it a little bit. Yeah, it's it like is. an exercise. Ooh, yeah. you want to play a game? Right. Let's evolve. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all evolve together. It's going to be so fun. Yeah. Get, get your teammate. That's right. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, Chris, this has been just the highlight of my day. Boy, what a great conversation. And your new book, I'm Not a Morning Person, you know, honestly, it should be required reading for life. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Deb. I've really enjoyed every yeah. moment of this and I've been very much looking forward to our conversation. Oh. So oh, I appreciate Well, you. thanks for coming on the podcast. Have a great day. I like doing dishes. I actually do. It gives me an immediate sense of accomplishment, which I absolutely love. But I have been struggling trying to find the right non-toxic or at least low-tox um, detergent for my dishwasher and for my sink or you know for doing dishes by hand so probably the my favorite one that I found is from a company called Young Living and it's called Thieves they have a powdered for your dishwasher and a liquid for your sink and I don't know how they do it and and make it so good and so low tox but I am a huge fan and especially when it comes to my dishwasher, if I'm going to start rinsing everything off the dishes, I might as well just go ahead and keep doing the dishes, right? So 
What I love about it is the, the dishes can be a little bit junky, maybe not super junky, like two days of eggs on it, but a little bit junky. I could put it in the dishwasher, use my um, Thieves from Young Living powder detergent, and it gets it clean. So um, I've got all the information in the show notes. And if you use the code SHAREYL, you actually get 10% off of your first order of $50. Happy dishwashing. Hey, y'all, can you do me a favor today and go and leave a review of this podcast? I know that the more great reviews, wink, wink, emphasis on great (laughs) reviews that I get, along with more downloads and more subscribers, that pushes this podcast out to people who might normally not even find it. And the reason I started this podcast and my real heart for starting this podcast is that I needed this information it wasn't available. And so I started a podcast so that I could be a blessing to others. Um, So you're a blessing to me just by being here. And again, thank you for your support. Thank you for your positive reviews and all of the notes that you send me. And also just want to say, hey, keep in mind, I'm, I'm not a doctor. And if you need medical advice, please reach out to your team. That is going to be just the best source for you because they know you. So again, I hope you enjoy this podcast.